We're reading now from Genesis, the last chapter of the first book of the Bible. We are reading from verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, forgive, I pray you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now we pray you, forgive the transgression of the servant of God, of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, fear not, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he reassured them and comforted them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How many of you watch Jeopardy? We have some Jeopardy players. Do you sit there and say the answers out loud so everybody in the room knows how smart you are? in the form of a question. Um, I do. I'm sitting by myself and I get one wrong and I look around to see if the dog noticed, but (laughs) I'm afraid to audition to go on Jeopardy because my mother keeps saying, oh, you should go out there and be on Jeopardy. You should be on Jeopardy. If I went on Jeopardy, you know what the categories would be? Old Testament, New Testament, saints at the church, religious holidays, and the question or the answer would be, who parted the Red Sea? And I would say, who is Noah? and I'd look like an idiot, so I don't ever go. (laughs) But this morning's category for all of you is sibling rivalries from scripture. The Bible is full of brothers and sisters who do not get along. Name a few. Cain and Abel. Abel. Didn't take long, did it? Adam and Eve, God creates the world in six days. On the seventh day, God rested. On the eighth day, Adam and Eve messed it up for everybody went on to have children, who then, one of them killed the other because he was jealous. Who else? Joseph and all his brothers. That's what we read this morning. Any others you can think of? Jacob and Esau steals the birthright from his brother. Or actually, his brother trades it for a bowl of lentils. Anyone else come to mind? Think New Testament. The prodigal son and his big brother who did not like at all that his brother had squandered their dad's money and then come crawling home. That's not the only brothers in scripture in the New Testament. They're the, the, the two and the father says to one, go out and do my will. And he says, yes, sir. And he doesn't do it. And the other says, yes, I will. They're the brothers that go to Jesus and say, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me now. There's Mary and Martha. What is it about brothers and sisters? That's a rhetorical question, because we'd be here all day if I let you answer that. What is it about brothers and sisters that they just can't seem to get along? Now, we have the end of the Joseph story, and I could ask you for, you know, let me have tribes of Israel for 2,000, Alex. Anybody here name all 12 of the sons of Israel? Let's see, Reuben. Sleepy Dopey Doc. We, we have trouble naming them all, but you know the story. What did they do to Joseph? First of all, why did they hate Joseph? I'm going to test your VBS remembrances if you haven't studied the Old Testament in a while, the Hebrew Bible. Why did his brothers hate him so much? He was dad's favorite. Because, oh, there's another, there's another duo, Leah and her sister. He thinks he's marrying one and he wakes up in the morning. Now people always say, how could they do that? It was thousands of years ago, no electric lights in a tent with veils. That's how they did it. (laughs) Thought he married one woman, woke up and went, whoa! (laughs) But the son of his favorite wife was his favorite child. And so he gave him a little gift that the others didn't get. What did he give him? A coat of many, see it's coming back, isn't it? A coat of many colors. And he's parading around in this beautiful coat in front of his brothers going, Dad likes me best. Now that's the Smothers Brothers with Mom, right? (laughs) Brothers just can't get along. Did you just put your arm around your brother? Aww. (laughs) Aww. So 
he has dreams. And in the dreams, the brothers are bowing down to him. And even the mother and father are bowing down to their son. They don't like this. So what is their idea of how to get even with him? Not first. They weren't going to sell him at first. They were going to kill him. They were going to kill him. But the older brothers realized that this would kill their father. And so why kill him when we could sell him into slavery? So they throw him in a hole until the slave traders come by. And they sell him. And he goes to Egypt. And the rest is history. He comes into power because he can interpret the dreams for the pharaoh. And in the pharaoh's dreams, there are seven skinny cows and seven fat cows. And it's keeping the pharaoh up at night. And he finds out that there is this guy, one of the slaves who can interpret dreams. And he says there will be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. He saves Egypt. So Egypt has storehouses of grain and plenty to spare. And then the brothers go out in search of food, and they come into Egypt. And guess who's in charge of the palace? Mm -hmm. The one they done wrong. They don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. Who wouldn't recognize all their brothers dressed as good Jewish men with beards? They don't recognize him, a clean-shaven Egyptian man. And after a long period of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and what's the question that Joseph wants to know when he finally reveals himself? Is my father still alive? Because his brothers hated him more than they loved their own father. They loved their father dearly, but they hated their brother more, to the point that they were ready to kill him. And instead of killing him, they break their father's heart. They take this beautiful coat and they shred it and they, they put a lamb's blood on it. They set up. He was killed by a wild animal. And the father grieves desperately and the brothers don't care because they hate their own brother that much. So let me ask you this, Church of God in Jesus Christ. Suppose you were Joseph. Do you think you would forgive them for what they had done to you? One of the saddest things that I've seen in the ministry is brokenness in families. And I've seen a lot of it. I was serving in the Deaf Church in Pasadena, Maryland. One of my best friends was appointed to the church in Deal, and I used to babysit for her on occasion. Her son, who is now grown and a pastor himself. But I was babysitting for him, and the doorbell rang, and I opened the door. It was one of her parishioners. It was a man who often brought her flowers, and things like that. He was an older man. And he introduced himself to me. And I said, you must be Bunny's brother, because he had a very distinctive last name. And I'd met his brother, Bunny. He took the flowers that he had and threw them at my feet and told me to go to hell. I was pretty taken aback by that, a pastor in her 20s being told to go to hell by someone's church member. And she came home. And I said, the weirdest thing happened. And I said, he came to the door with flowers. And she said, George. I said, yes, and I said, and I said to him, he must be Bunny's brother. And she said, oh, you didn't say that, did you? She said, they haven't spoken to each other in 40 years. And George hated his brother so much that at the sound of his name, he had a meltdown. I moved from there, went to my next congregation, and sure enough, there were twin brothers. I made the mistake of calling one by the other's name, and he said, don't ever do that to me again. I said, I'm sorry, you don't get mistaken for each other. He said, I will not be mistaken for him. Now, Bunny and George went to separate services. But when the brothers in my congregation were fighting, and they were not kids. These are men in their 70s. They were still fighting over who got custody of the 11, p 11 AM worship service. We had three services, but I was here first. You go to the other one. No, you go to the other one. So what they did was one sat in that corner, one sat in this corner. You know why they did that? So they'd never have to take communion together. I have seen families destroyed over who gets grandmom's teacup. And in my own family, my grandmother had her children all together one more time for the first time in over 20 years at her funeral, but never when she was alive. 
Forgiveness. It's a tough subject, isn't it? But we have this example in Joseph that is just amazing. And you know, the brothers are tricking him again because according to the biblical scholars, when they say, oh, you know, before dad died, he said he wanted you to forget. He never said that. We have no evidence of that, and there would be evidence of that. Even the, the Jewish scholars who put together the Hebrew Bible, that worried them because that was not mentioned in Scripture. So yet again, they're saying, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. He forgave us once. But now that dad's gone, our number might be up. So they trick him again, saying, our father wanted you to forgive us. But he already had. And he said, God used what you did that was certainly evil. But God used it to save our people. And I will take care of you and your little ones, your children, your grandchildren, your progeny for generations. I will take care of them. That's pretty magnanimous, I think. But we still have a hard time forgiving. I shared something with the group that's studying Amish grace that I heard years ago, and I was going to look up who said it, and I can't remember who said it, and I forgot to look it up. But withholding forgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Think on that for a moment. Withholding forgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. How many of you are reading the Amish Grace book? An amazing story, isn't it? People who forgave an unthinkable crime against the most innocent of their own. They forgave, and they still work on forgiving. But we tend to attach forgive to forget, forgive and forget. I was able to meet with a man named Chris at the Amish market, who was a neighbor of the little girl who survived and is continuously on life support to maintain her life. And I asked him about forgiving and forgetting. He said, we'll never forget what happened. But it's not about that, is it? Forgiveness is not a magic wand, and it's not a momentary, spontaneous thing that happens. Boom, and it's done. It's a process. It's work. It's intentionality. It's agape, the love that we talk about that mirrors the love that Christ had for the church that is an act of will. Forgiveness is an act of will. Don't wait till it feels good, because you may never do it. Because I don't think Joseph felt really good when he saw his brothers again. Because even though he was living in the palace and in charge of the estate of the pharaoh, he was still enslaved. And he was separated from his full brother. He was separated from the father he loved. He was in exile in a foreign country because his brothers were jealous of their father's love for him. They were willing to sacrifice all to get rid of him. And yet, he forgives. I don't know why we're so amazed by stories of forgiveness, because we pray every time we gather for worship, the Lord's Prayer, which is why we read it this morning. It's foundational to the Amish practice of faith and Christianity. It's foundational to Amish discipline. That's the first prayer they teach their children, and it is the only prayer that is ever prayed aloud when the Amish gather for worship, because to pray sounds lofty. To pray is what Jesus says, and those were the words of Jesus teaching us how to pray from the sixth chapter of Matthew, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount, the foundations of faith that he's teaching his disciples. He says, don't be like the hypocrites who heap up empty phrases, and so the Amish take that at its word, and they read this prayer only aloud as they worship. Other prayer is private done in secret to the God who is in secret, just as Jesus said. And what is it that we say every time we pray? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or the version we read this morning from the New Revised Standard Version, forgive us our debts as we forget of our debtors. But really what we're saying is forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Think about that for a moment. Forgive our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Let's put it in starker terms. Forgive me, Lord, but only to the extent that I am willing to forgive others. 
that really hits a little harder, doesn't it? Or to put it in the reverse, God, don't forgive me if I can't forgive anyone else. Just don't forgive me at all. That's what we pray. And what does the old saying say? Be careful what you pray for. People who are astounded by the Amish ability to forgive don't understand that it is based in the Sermon on the Mount, which they teach again and again and again in worship. Some people, when I ask, what are you surprised about when you read the book? You know, there is no Amish Sunday school. There is no formal religious education. The religious education is living the faith of God in Jesus Christ, as Christ proclaims in Scripture. And they take very seriously what comes right after the prayer, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. For if you forgive others, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. And they take that at its word, and they live that to the best of their ability. Now, they're not superhuman. And Jesus, when he walked among us, was human. And Joseph was very human. But in their conversations with God, which is a two-way conversation, Melissa was absolutely right with the children this morning, prayer is a two-way conversation. And if we pray, God, forgive our sins if we are willing to forgive others, we need to understand that God is listening to those words and looking into our hearts to see if that is what we'll be able to do. It's not easy to forgive, and I think it's almost harder to forgive the people who hurt you that you know, that you live in the same house with or grew up with. But to withhold forgiveness for someone else is like drinking poison and expecting that person to die. What happens if you drink poison? Not a rhetorical question. What happens if you're the one who drinks the poison? You're the one who's going to die. I asked Mike to put on the sign out front this week, make Lent count. Make Lent count. My prayer for each of us is that as we struggle to forgive the wrongs done to us, that we can look not to our own strength, not to our own natural inclinations, because if somebody really ticks you off, you are mad. Ask my sister. I used to, my mother would put our hair up in those plastic foam curlers on Saturday night. Any of you remember those? Anybody from that generation? I had a lot of hair. I had a lot of curlers. You can't sleep because they're always sticking in your eye and in your face. You know what I did every Sunday morning as I took the curlers out of my hair? Each single curler I bounced off my sister's face. Why? <laughs> because I could. And she would say with each one, quit it, quit it, quit it, quit it. Until she'd finally get tired and smack me and I'd say, Mom Robin hit me. <laughs> That's our natural inclination. But Christ our Savior calls us to something more, not to look to our own strength, but to look to him. So if you got a cup of poison, put it down. Make this Lent count and forgive. Because if you pray, God, forgive me, to the extent that I am willing to forgive others. And if you don't forget the part on the end, for if you forgive others from your heart, your Heavenly Father will forgive you, but if you do not forgive them, neither will you be forgiven. You will be careful about what you pray, and you will let Christ take the lead. To his glory and honor, amen.